Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, today we're talking about Game of Thrones spin-offs. We've got a lot to talk about, um, all of the spin-offs we already know about, and this week, breaking news, a new Jon Snow spin-off. And literally in the last hour or so, George R. R. Martin has done a reaction on his not a blog so we we get to know what he thinks about this as well as just sort of the leaks and rumors that have been coming out from elsewhere um what i try to do at the beginning of all of these live streams is just to give a flavor of what's coming up oh, i'm gonna go through that quickly today because i really want to talk about all of this uh spin-off stuff one thing uh, Westworld Season 4 is happening this Sunday. If you're a Westworld fan, it's really kind of snuck up on us this time, hasn't it? Uh, but the trailers look amazing. Everything I've seen looks good, so it's it's promising. Um, I won't be covering it this time in the same kind of depth as I have previous seasons, so I would highly recommend, if you want to get some uh, good quality, in fact, excellent quality, uh, coverage on YouTube of Westworld, then please go and check out uh, my friend Hacks Dogma. Uh, the channel over there has always produced, in my view, the best um, content on Westworld and a number of other things as well. So please do go and check out Hacks Dogma. I'm sure if you're watching live, one of the moderators will put a link in the chat, wherever that is. Um, and uh, do go and give my best regards when you get there. So what we're going to do, I think, today is um, I what I thought would be useful before we get into the meat of what George R. R. Martin said is to just give a little bit of a flavour of the background to all of this, because there are a lot of different uh, leaks that have happened over uh, several years now. Rumours of what might be in the works confirmations, a couple of cancellations. So I thought if I just give the potted history first, and then we'll get into the meat of what is definitely happening, what's uh, uh, what's not happening. Um, and yeah, obviously take any questions that you have about the Jon Snow show or the other spin-offs. I'm not going to talk about House of the Dragon so much this time. Uh, we all know it's happening. Uh, and I've done many other live streams uh, about that. So I'm not going to pick up on that um, in great depth this time. Um, uh, Andreas in the chat saying, I expect at least 20 minutes of ghost footage each episode. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Reflective Rambling saying, Justin at Top Shelf Fandom will be covering Westworld as well. Excellent. Yes, another a friend of the channel, Justin. Hi, if you're watching. Uh, Mara Lee, thank you so much for the super sticker and I think the super chat as well uh, before we went live. And Jewel Elson, thank you for the super sticker. This is a keep it up that one says. Thank you very much. Okay, let's do the... Um, actually, one more comment from the chat. Uh, Beesman saying, ghost puppies or riot? I can't really argue with that. Okay, let's give the background to all of this. So the earliest rumblings of there being spin-offs actually you have to go back as far as something like 2016. Uh, George R. R. Martin, this is before season six of Game of Thrones, and it was the biggest show on the planet, and it was just getting bigger with each season. And they realised that they had a massive hit on their hands. They also realised it was going to be coming to an end relatively soon. And George R. R. Martin realized this too. And George R. R. Martin started talking up, <coughs> pardon me, started talking up the possibility of there being, he, he, he's talked about there being thousands of possible stories uh, set in his world. So he was sort of slowly pitching to them. And out of this emerged a few clear favorites. By the time we get to 2018, before season eight, so the hype is at its maximum at this point, one of these got commissioned for a pilot. This was known as Blood Moon. George R. R. Martin kept on referring to it as The Long Night. Perhaps it would have eventually turned into being called The Long Night. But basically, this was the story of the original Long Night. It went to pilot and... Um, it got cancelled. <laughs> it's a bit of a mystery about exactly what happened. Again, lots of rumours about exactly what happened. I will give my thoughts on that in just one moment. But that did not progress. But at that time, before season eight, 
there were rumours of about five different projects in the works. There was rumours about the Dance of the Dragons project, which eventually turned into um, House of the Dragon, Duncan Egg. We heard something about the Valyrian Freehold. There was Bravos. Um, lots of ideas going around. Nothing was really pushed forward. And George R. R. Martin, at that time, uh, I was looking for the quote. I couldn't find the quote. But at that time, I, I remember he said, we're not really looking at the moment for things that have characters that are in Game of Thrones. This was all prequels rather than sequels. Then season eight happened. And season eight, as we know, had mixed reviews. Let's put it that way. And suddenly, HBO felt, my interpretation of events, felt that the world slowly shifted a bit. No longer had they got this unstoppable juggernaut of a franchise that they could make anything and people would watch it if they badged it Game of Thrones. Now suddenly they felt they had to win back a few fans. And Blood Moon, my take, whether it was not good in other ways, it was a risk because none of the families we knew existed, none of the places we knew existed. This was going completely off of uh, um, away from George R. R. Martin's. It would be in line with George R. R. Martin's writing, but it was very clear that this was not him creating a story for them. This was, Jane Goldman was the, the showrunner for that. This was her view, her imagination, based off of George R. R. Martin's writings. It was a risk. And I think that they decided, based on the fact that they cancelled that and immediately went to a full season order for House of the Dragon, Targaryens, dragons, everybody knows what's going on here. That was the easy option. So, that's what we got uh, around, around 2019, the safe option of House of the Dragon, which is, so far, looking really good. So I think that was a good choice to, to go ahead with that one. Um, skip forward a couple of years to last year. George R. R. Martin signs a five-year deal with HBO. And this is for a lot of money. We're not told exactly how much. We're told it's a mid-eight-figure deal for five years exclusive for HBO to be developing projects. We're told of, at the time, six projects. Um, Nymeria, Callis Velaryon, Fleabottom, Duncan Egg, an anime as well as House of the Dragon. That So that was what we were told about at the time. There were other things apparently in the works, but that's what we were told about at the time. Flea Bottom got dropped at some point around here. We never got huge amounts of information about what this Flea Bottom show was going to be about, but the idea seemed to be, let's not just concentrate on the the lords and ladies of this world, the 1%, let's focus in on the normal people, the small folk which seemed like a reasonable idea to me, but for whatever reason, it never gained traction, so that has now officially been dropped. It's not uh, one of the projects that's being pushed forward. Um, at which point, George R. R. Martin, if you're a fan of his Not A Blogs, and we'll come on to his Not A Blog in just a second, he started coming up with his own personal code for what was happening. Um, hinting at how many projects there were um he started talking about the frogs are hopping and the frogs being his um code word for the different projects that he had on the go with hbo tv shows that were in development in some way and <coughs> he uh I can't remember exactly when it was, but he had this picture of nine frogs, five red and four green, or the other way around, I can't remember. And at the time, the best guesses were that this is um, nine shows on the go, in development in some way, five live action, four anime of some description. So that was where we were at um, last year. Then... Earlier on this year, in a blog post, um, George R. R. Martin gave a broad update on all of this. 
he he said, and this is quoting from him, there are also the successor, successor shows. These have taken a ton of my time and attention this year. I have seen some comments out there questioning how much I am involved in these new series. The answer is a lot. Deeply, heavily involved in every one of the new shows. It's my world. And while I've been working closely with some fantastic writers and showrunners, ultimately it is up to me to try and keep the canon well canonical and to do all I can to make the new shows great. So that was the position at the beginning of the year. George R. R. Martin has active involvement in each and every one of these shows we're going to be talking about. That's what he says. He seems to be bought into this. This is this is the, the flip side of the concentrating a little bit less on writing The Winds of Winter is that he's concentrating a bit more on the TV shows. So uh, it we may not like some of the bad sides, but we have to accept that there are some good sides to this. So let me run down what these different shows are, and then I'll get to the recent news and what George R. 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 Martin has said about it. House of the Dragon, we already know. Um, the Jon Snow sequel, which we will talk about in depth in just one moment. The Sea Snake, which is uh, about, it was previously titled Nine Voyages. This is about Corlys Velaryon. We're going to be meeting Corlys Velaryon in House of the Dragon. This is in his younger days when he went on these nine great voyages exploring the world of Westeros, es Essos, uh, Sothorius, and beyond. 10,000 Ships, which is Princess Nymeria's story. Uh, Duncan Egg. The Golden Empire, which is an anime about Yi Ti. Um, and at least two more animes. We're not told what, but whenever they're discussed, it, we're told about the Golden Empire and the other animes, plural. So at least two more. And then I also want to touch on at the end of all of this, the, the thing that I'm perhaps most excited about, which is the tourney at Harrenhal stage play, which was also announced a year or two ago. Not heard much about since, it has to be said but could give us huge amounts of information that would be absolutely fascinating. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the um, shows in development. And a, a few bits to keep in mind. The first is that not all of these will progress to be actual TV shows. George R. R. Martin is very upfront about this. Everybody's very upfront about this. We've got what, nine things now that we're aware of. Not all nine will be TV shows. Um, some of these will not happen. That might be budget. That might be the script wasn't good enough. That might be uh, it clashes with something else. Any, any number of reasons. But we will almost certainly not get all of these on TV. Secondly, this will take a while. None of these have been greenlit. House of the Dragon is the only thing that has been greenlit. Nothing else has even had been greenlit for pilot. So that's going to take at least two years now before we see anything on TV on, for any of these. We will get season two of House of the Dragon before we get any of these other shows um, at, as a minimum. As a, as a sort of a final thing, uh, I would say... My best guess is we are going to get an announcement at some point soon from HBO. The wider context on all of this is that there is there's a streaming war going on. We all know that there is. We've got Netflix, who are yes, they had a a bad six months or year, but they are massive still, and they have been taking away a lot of the the Emmys and Golden Globes and things that. HBO basically got used to getting for their top shows. There's also Disney with Disney Plus who have launched universes now. We've got the Marvel Universe and we've got the Star Wars Universe. This is the model that a lot of people are now starting to head towards for good and ill, I would personally argue, is you have a hit show, film, whatever, you then see whether you can expand it out into a universe which means some films, some TV shows, some animes, maybe stage play, just make it bigger across as many different um, formats as you possibly can. 
so that is where the industry is heading this is hbo's vehicle for doing that it would not surprise me if they follow the broad model that we had with the mandalorian where the mandalorian season one was a success at the end of that disney just suddenly said here's a list of and i can't remember what it was like eight shows these are all happening here's Boba fett's going to be happening another season of mandalorian is going to be happening obi-wan kenobi is going to be happening the bad batch is going to be happening there's this whole series of all these different shows that they just told us in one go were, were going to happen Th there is a lot riding on this for hbo they need to make sure this happens that so house of the dragon is their mandalorian in many ways if this is a big success they can do lots of things off of the back of it if House of the Dragon isn't such a big success, maybe they won't push so much uh, behind it. Maybe they will look at other shows. Uh, maybe they'll think, well, okay, Game of Thrones time has passed. But they there is a lot riding on on this for HBO. So that's the uh, that's the background. Let's get in to talk about this news about the Jon Snow show. Uh, the the news broke uh, a few days ago, and um, this came from Hollywood Reporter. Um, this came from uh, a well-respected journalist um, there, a guy called um, James Hibbert, who has written before about Game of Thrones. He wrote the Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon uh, book, if you've read that. So he's got a lot of contacts in there in the... in. HBO and with the actors and people like this. So this was a very reputable source. And then today, a BBC article on the BBC web, uh, website had an interview with Amelia Clark. This was about a stage play that she's doing. It, it was quite wide ranging, not a huge interview, but it was relatively wide ranging talking about her work doing Game of Thrones, how can she move on from that, um, a lot of other issues there, and it got on to this spin-off, this Jon Snow spin-off, and this is what it said. In response to a story in The Hollywood Reporter that Kit Harrington will reprise his role as Jon Snow in a Game of Thrones sequel, Amelia Clark said, he has told me about it, and I know it exists, it's happening. Then, perhaps realising she may have said more than she should have, she adds, it's been created by Kit, as far as I can understand, so he's in it from the ground up. So what you will be watching, hopefully, if it happens, is certified by Kit Harrington. So this is not a um, just a random bit of speculation. This is a, this is a leak which actually happened and then... Uh, it has now been confirmed by a number of different sources. George R. R. Martin, just to round out this so that we've got um, uh, all the information to I hope you can see this. This is George R. R. Martin's uh, blog post from literally only an hour or so ago. Um, I won't read it all out, but this responds to the story we've just had. Um, so I'll try and pick out the... Uh, the important bits. He says, um, news is broken about the Jon Snow development and I'm being deluged, deluged with requests for comment. So, yes, there is a Jon Snow show in development. The Hollywood Reporter story was largely correct and I would expect no less from James Hibbert. He then goes on to say a few nice things about James Hibbert as a journalist. Our working title for the show is Snow. There are four live-action successor shows in development at HBO. Word got out about three of them some time ago. 10,000 Ships, the Nymeria show, helmed by Amanda Siegel, Sea Snake, aka Nine Voyages with Bruno Heller, and The Drunken Egg Show, The Hedge Knight or Knight of the Seven Kingdoms with Steve Conrad writing. I think some of these were officially announced. In other cases, news leaked out. Snow has been in development almost as long as the other three, but for whatever reason, it was never announced and it never leaked until now. But yes, it is true. So um, the next bit is 
basically him covering his own back, saying James Hibbard did ask me about it and I didn't tell him, but somebody else obviously did. Um, the, he says there's not much more I can tell you until HBO gives him the green light. Basically, uh, this is him just putting his side of the story out without any particular clearance to say anything new from um, HBO, but he can con what we've got. He talks about um, this Amelia Clark interview as well. He says that it seems as though Amelia Clark has already mentioned that Snow was Kit's idea in a recent interview, so that part is out. Yes, it was Kit Harrington who brought the idea to us. I cannot tell you the names of the writers or showrunners since that has not been cleared for release yet, but Kit brought them in too, his own team, and they are terrific. Various rumours are floating around about my involvement or lack of same. I am involved, just as I am with the Hedge Knight and the Sea Snake and 10,000 Ships and all the animated shows. Kit's team have visited me here in Santa Fe and worked with me and my own team of brilliant, talented writer consultants to hammer out the show. Um, then the, the next bit is what I was saying earlier, but it's, it's worth, I think, reiterating it because George R. R. Martin's saying it, not me. All four of these successor shows are still in the script stage. Outlines and treatments have been written and approved. Scripts have been written. Notes have been given. Second and third drafts have been written. So far, that's all. Nothing has been greenlit yet. Uh, there is no guarantee when or if um, it will be on any of the shows. The likelihood of all four series getting on the air, well, I'd love it, but that's not the way it usually works. Um, so that's pretty much it. That there is a long, it's, it's worth reading the entire blog. If you're interested in his thoughts, he he mentions a little bit just by the by about being misquoted or taken out of context when uh, asked about the Rings of Power. And uh, uh, he said that, yes, he's competitive, but he hopes ho both series are very good and very successful. Um, and a lot of people took a lot of what he said out of context there. But the other thing just meant to mention in passing, almost the last line, yes, Winds of Winter, no, I have not forgotten. I was back with Tyrion this past week. So um, that's that's where we're at on, uh, on the Winds of Winter. This is new. We've, he's not been focusing on Tyrion for uh, the Winds of Winter for uh, for a while, it last we heard, which was a week or two ago, he was doing Jamie and Brienne. He just finished a chunk on Cersei. So don't think we learn all that much other than the fact that, yes, he's getting to some Tyrion chapters. OK, so let's uh, let's get into what, what all of this might mean. Um, it, it's good news, I think, that he is involved. Um, I think it's reassuring that this has been going on for quite some time. This hasn't been kicked out by him or anyone else early on for being a rubbish idea. Um, I, what I think I'll do is give my initial reaction to it. I've got some questions for my patrons, as always. I'll try and frame this round question for my patrons. I would love to know what you in the chat think as well. I will I will dive into the chat quite a lot during this stream and, and get a flavour of what people are thinking. But I'll start off with my... Uh, my initial reaction when I heard this, which was something along the lines of, uh, I, I tweeted this out, I will take quite a lot of convincing that this is a good idea. I think that's still my position. And I say that not because uh, of any dislike of the character of Jon Snow or Kit Harrington. I think Kit Harrington's a good actor. I think he did a good job with Jon Snow. Um, nor doubting actually that they could come up with stories. I've got some questions about that in in a moment. I, I'm sure they can. If you put enough clever people in, in a room, in a, a world as interesting as George R. R. Martin's, you can come up with stories. I, I don't think that that's a, a problem. It may, they, it's also not, I mean, I'm not doubting that it could be a good show either. I think it may well be a good show. Um, it's just for me personally, I I kind of want to leave Jon Snow where we left him as a character. 
that's just my gut instinct. I'm happy to have that challenged uh, by the show being good. I will definitely start watching it and see see where it takes me. But uh, of all of the character endings in the TV show, the one that I personally liked the most and felt was probably most likely to be their ending in the books was Jon Snow at the very end, heading north, north of the wall, um, broken by what had happened. And in a kind of a Frodo-like way, he could not enjoy the fruits of, of his labor. He just had to go away and make a new start somewhere else. So that is almost where I want to leave him. I want to, I want to just know that he's, he's, his troubles and weary times are behind him. Um, Jon Snow did not have an easy... Nobody had an easy time uh, in Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones, but Jon Snow didn't. And I imagine in the last couple of books, uh, his uh, path is going to be very stony. So I, I, I quite like to leave the character there. That's my gut instinct. Now, um, I'd be interested to know if anyone else shares that view. Um, the one thing I would highlight from all of this is this is a sequel. Everything else we've seen so far are prequels. And that in and of itself adds another layer to this. The, the world that George R. R. Martin has built for me, it's his world, he can do with it as he wishes if he's involved fine but for me it kind of it's a meta story that will end with the end of a song of ice and fire this is the song of ice and fire that the threat from ice the threat from fire when those threats have been dealt with that is the end of that huge millennia long arc story arc so yes of course you can have a story after that but there's so much you can have within that. I don't know. Um, it's it's quite a um, it's it's quite a hard thing to sort of put your finger on. Other than that, this doesn't feel right. And that just from my read of the core fandom, not necessarily the wider people who are probably going to be targeted uh, to watch this, but the core fandom. My instinct is that most, not all, but most people have reservations about this. Um, let's get to a question from uh, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert. Hola. I would personally prefer that the Jon Snow spin off doesn't happen. As for me, season eight of Game of Thrones was so disappointing that I don't think they could pull off a show that is as good without the source material from George R.R. R. Martin. I know the hatred in me is starting to take over. Would you prefer that the spin off does happen or would you prefer that it doesn't? I, for me, I, at a very high level, I. I don't put myself into this world world of whether it happens or not happens. If it happens, I want it to be good. Um, as it stands, I I can't I can't buy into this. I'm happy to be persuaded otherwise. Uh, but as it stands, I think there are a lot of other stories there. Um, this is the kind of thing where we do know nothing about this. We we literally have nothing here. HBO have not even commented or confirmed anything. We know zero about what this could be so um they could take it in ways that i really don't want them to they could do something um completely new and different take him in a completely different direction that we we simply do not know yet so i'm skeptical um andrew case saying um uh, I agree. I can use my imagination for the rest of John's life and arc. Just want him left alone, moving on from the events of A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, Michael Shersby saying, I'm going to be charitable to this because Kit is the creator. Um, Canadian Fantasy Corner saying, maybe they'll kill off Bran and someone else will make a grab for the throne and John's going to rush south to help out. Um, the real YT saying I'm with Robert so far all the other extended universe has not been great all my Star Wars has been murdered um, yeah and I mean the Star Wars fans 
it takes quite a lot sometimes to uh, keep Star Wars fans happy. But I think the um, not all of the shows have been very well received there. Um, Michael Shersby saying Kit could want to reclaim his character from the showrunners. He's spoken about his depression. Um, uh, Morris Morrison saying, I'm sorry to disagree with you on Jon Snow. I really disliked the fact uh, that Jon returned to a frozen hard place where every time he sees a cave, he's reminded of Igrit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's n it wasn't a it wasn't a sad ending. It was, George R. R. Martin would say, bittersweet. And one of the overlooked by some, but I think in critically important things, which happened in that, and that that scene, whatever else happened in season eight, that scene I really liked. As they headed north, you just saw that a little shoot of like a, a plant or something was coming up through the snow, and spring, summer was going to come. And so this is not, to me, this is not a sad ending. It's it's got hope in it and it's a hope that he doesn't he, he no longer will feel okay south of the wall but he does and it's said lots of times in the books you know he's he's got a lot of the north in him and obviously uh with ghost as well there will be dire wolves there uh stephen donnelly saying on paper john is a strong enough character to base the show around but past experience seems to hint that when there's no source material to draw from, the story loses its complexity, nuance, and sharpness. Um, reflective Rambling saying, my theory, Snow is a way to get the long night story done. Things he finds up north trigger insight to the past that the north forgot. Reshaping wildling life and culture is not enough. Um, okay, that's that's a really interesting part. I, I've got some questions here. Uh, from my patrons I'm going to pick up on uh, as well, which sort of link in with a lot of that. Um, Andrea Quaid saying, without the source material, this could be disappointment to book readers in particular. Where do you think they're going to take the story? And Nonduck20 saying, um, like many others, I'm worried. What story could they possibly tell? Where would the new threat come from? There are no more others, giants or children of the forest. Um, it would be entertaining to see John and Tormund hunting, ice fishing, and clowning around all day, but that wouldn't make uh, the season successful. Um, what might they do with Ghost? Um, and Lady Maze Mormont saying, do you think this new show will be used to wrap up unused storylines from Game of Thrones? Resurrection is a strong theme in A Song of Ice and Fire. Perhaps Danny will come back. What are your theories of whether that is the case? So let's pick up the idea of will they try and go with some storylines from game of thrones they may will they bring danny back i don't think so i that for me on a few different levels firstly if you read that um interview with the bbc she is is asked would you ever return and she basically says no i'm done um, so I don't think she personally will want to return. I don't think they would have Daenerys return if it's not her. I very much doubt that uh, Kit Harrington would write her in without having discussed it with her, and there's no hint of that in there. Um, and also, on a slightly higher level, perhaps, for me personally, I think that story has finished that that arc there the john and daenerys thing i i feel that has ended uh for me the the story of a song of ice and fire is as i said pushing back ice getting rid of the threat from ice getting rid of the threat from fire so the dragons have to have moved back in whatever way that is if they're not killed then they need to have gone away from westeros and having danny returning with drogon suddenly makes this the Daenerys Targaryen show uh, because Drogon is so huge and big and powerful. It would no longer be the Jon Snow show. This would be the Daenerys Targaryen. This would be the return of the dragons. We've seen dragons now in main Game of Thrones, also in House of the Dragon. I think that they're not going to go down that route. 
Might they, uh, Reflective Rambling, you're asking or suggesting that maybe they would try and tie up a few loose ends in terms of the law that they never really covered in Game of Thrones. Uh, there were huge amounts of law that they missed out on with the others, like, why were they there? What was motivating them? The show didn't tell us any of these things. The books, I'm sure, will. Um, but will they want to go back there? I think the question is, did, would they want this to be harking back to the bits of Game of Thrones that people didn't like? And I think the answer is no. I think that the uh, the idea has to be that this is John going off and doing something new. This is about the character John, and this is about how he rebuilds himself as a person after the events of, of Game of Thrones. So that said, what could they do? I mean, lots of different things. Uh, if he is now leading, and it wasn't made clear on the TV show, um, and this, I should say, this is TV show world, not a Song of Ice and Fire world. This is not the book world. Yes, his very the very end point may be the same or similar, but I don't think it's going to they're building off of what happened on the TV show, not what happened in the books. So we're moving further away from the books in this. But what might that character do? Well, he seems to be the leader of the wildlings there. Would he go back? Would he try and rebuild um, Hardhome? Would he um, fall in love again? It's entirely possible those things might happen. Uh, I could see just off the top of my head, I was just thinking, what kind of story could they come up with? Let's imagine we cut to a few years later. He is up there um, at the head of some community north of the wall. He's got this budding romance with someone where he doesn't want to commit. He's had some bad um, experiences in love in the past, um, but there's there's a connection there. Uh, what happens if there's a raid from someone on Skagos or some slaver ships from somewhere in, over in the, the free cities and they take this person, he can go after them. That's a, that's a, that's a plot idea. Are they going to go with that? Probably not. But it's an example that you can do something which is nothing to do with the main Game of Thrones plot and is about character development for Jon Snow. So the the possibilities are there to do this. They can um, just leave Game of Thrones behind and just focus in on Jon Snow. That said, I doubt they'll be able to resist some things harking back to Game of Thrones. They, they, they will probably want, to, at least to start with, to uh, create its own niche. but there are in the tv show world there are various characters who could make an appearance even if you discount people like Daenerys coming back um obviously Tormund Tormund is uh, Tormund is there I would hope that he'll be a major part of this uh show because he was such a fantastic character but what about um Sansa if she's there being the Queen of the North, effectively, Lady of Winterfell. Is is there ever going to be a need for him to get back in contact with Winterfell? That would be a character development if he had to go back south of the Wall. He wouldn't want to. Uh, but if he had to go back to Winterfell, that would be quite interesting. Arya, he always has a strong connection with Arya. Arya's headed off uh, to the west in a boat. At some point she will return, one would think. Where, where will she go after that? Perhaps she'll go and try and find John. So there's a possibility for Arya there. Bran will be keeping an eye on what's going on in his kind of weirdy way. Uh, so there are lots of characters who you might see making a reappearance. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if they do hark back to some Game of Thrones things. But I, I don't... Think. And in fact, I hope that they don't try to 
do this as John now goes to try and figure out what on earth was happening with the White Walkers. For me, that wouldn't work. I just I think they just leave that alone. Let the books explain it all. Um, I don't think that he. I don't think he cares that much about it. That's not the driver for him. He has to have some driver. Um, and for him, it's about love and duty. Those are the things, that, the, the characteristics of Jon Snow. It's, as with Ned Stark, it's this um, constant interplay between love and duty. He should do this. His heart wants him to do that. What's he going to do? Um, and usually duty seems to be winning out over love so that's the, the the interplay we've got hopefully they will be able to use that as a sort of a character development tool rather than just have him uh, explore things because it would be quite fun to find them out uh, Jay Martinez saying, I love the idea of the show, but also a lot of questions. Would John be considered king beyond the wall? Um, they might go with that. Um, he wasn't, when he went north, there weren't actually that many wildlings with him. So this is, this is a repopulating effort in, um, Again, this is show law, but basically the wildlings were completely wiped out. There, there appears to be just this small group of 40, 50 of them left, um, and they are the ones who are heading back north of the wall. So this is a repopulation exercise. Um, would he claim that title for himself? I very much doubt it, but it's very much in Jon Snow's... Um, uh, world to have people giving him titles. Um, I think it would be quite a grandiose title for that uh, small number of people, but I don't know. Um, I suspect he won't be. The king beyond the wall, if even the wall itself is kept there because some of it has been destroyed, that will be an interesting thing. Actually, I've only just thought about that. If we are moving forward, what's going to happen with the wall? What's going to? Are they just going to keep it there? The point of the wall has now gone. Would they perhaps try and break down a bit more of the wall? Who knows? Um, Roman Lakovet saying, if John's ending on the show lines up with George R. R. Martin's original plan for him, why did George approve this project? Um, Interesting question. So there's there are a couple of layers to this. The first one, we do not know the details of George R. R. Martin's agreement with HBO. We know that he's been given a lot of money for them to be doing shows in his world. And as part of that, he appears to be signed up to be effectively executive producer on all of them. And we do not know the extent to which he's got veto. He's not talked about that. HBO have not talked about that. And we don't know whether he can veto any shows full stop or any bits of law or whatever. It's in everyone's best interest for both sides to get along well. But um, he, with the main Game of Thrones TV show, he took an increasingly pragmatic approach to it, it has to be said, by saying these things are going in different directions. Um, so that's the first thing. I don't know whether or not he even had the opportunity to veto this, so I don't think we can really speculate it. What, the, on the other part of it, John's if John's ending on the show lines up with his original plan for him, why did he approve this project? Well... It, I think it's that last scene is for me the last scene is the bit that lines up and George R. Martin did say the big beats of this story will be the same in the book and the tv show but that doesn't mean that he is the same I think the, there is going to be a huge difference between book John and tv show John and the main initial bit was, is his death on the on the show when Jon Snow came back from the dead he just like <gasps> woke up and he was a little bit more morose but no real difference in character George R. R. Martin I think will not be able to resist the fact he's already teed it up in uh, the Varamyr Sixkins 
prologue. If you walk into your wolf when your body dies, then you slowly become like your wolf. That's what's going to happen to John. He is going to become more like Ghost. So even if he's then pulled back out, as, as I think is going to happen, pulled back out of uh, Ghost's body and put back into his own body, he will be more wolfish. He is not going to be the same character that we had uh, in the early books. He will be different. And that means that the the character at the end of all of this is going to be very different as well. So, yes, I think that final scene uh, is going to be very similar, but that doesn't mean that the character moving through that scene is going to be the same character. Um, yeah, I, I was about to go off on a, a digression about why I think that final scene is, is likely, uh, but... Um, uh, let's not go right down that route. Um, I've got some more questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, uh, Beesman, if cameos are uh, envoys north and fan services are messages brought with dark wings, sure. If camera goes south of the wall, cheap fan service is, I think, almost inevitable and hollow because you won't get full cast back, obviously. Yeah, so... Cheap fan service. I don't think any of us want cheap fan service. It, I could, I could cope with occasional cameos, um, but I don't think. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I would prefer it if, if this goes ahead, this be a character-driven piece where John stays north of the wall. And doesn't interact with anything else. We we will have Tormund. We'll have some other wildlings around there. I'm sure they will have some other wild and interesting characters who who are completely new to us. But I would personally prefer that he does not venture south. Um, he does not meet up again with um, any of his old buddies, his family, or anything like that. This is a complete new start because that is what I, my interpretation of that is what he was intending a completely new start. Not, I will head north of the wall and then, yeah, I'll give it a year or two, then I'll come back and I'll sit in Winterfell for the rest of my life. That's not what that ending felt like to me. That the ending felt like I'm going off to make a new start. Uh, Sydney Rose saying, so many of our great stories end when the war ends, but life continues after war. In a meta way, I think that a John story could be a texted story about PTSD, healing and beginning again. It could. It could. And I mean, this is, while, while, I, while I've been doing this stream, I, me talking my, myself around to the way that I think this could work, if it does work, which is this character-based narrative for him, not about a follow-up to uh, the the action of Game of Thrones, but him as a person. How do you rebuild your life after what happened? Um, because the difference is, although I've used the Frodo analogy several times in the past, the difference between Frodo heading west and Jon Snow heading north is that Frodo's heading off to a place of peace and love and harmony, and Jon Snow is not. Uh, Jon Snow is going somewhere which he knows is a hard climate. He just wants to be somewhere else. And so how do you, in that climate, it's a darker story, yes, but how do you, in that climate, make yourself better, help yourself to recover? How do other people help you recover? Uh, so, yeah, that's the way that the best that I can see that this could possibly work. Uh, Vic Allen saying, my concern is that it will be like Joey, an awful week spin-off with dire cameos, uh, which the audience applaud wildly for. That's Joey was the Friends spin-off for anyone who had the good fortune and not to see it. Um, it didn't work <laughs> really well. Um Aaron Trohill saying, hey, I finally caught one of your streams. Big fan, Robert. Keep on keeping on, man. Well, welcome. Uh, great to see you. Um, I think I had another one. Uh, Spartan Warrior 64. 
four. I didn't see a question attached to that. Um, so, yeah, I, hopefully one of the moderators will pick um, uh, pick up on that if it's there. Oh, here we go. Uh, Sasuke, thank you very much, saying um, Iron Bank being the main antagonist. They might want what is owed uh, back from failed kings and monarchies of Westeros and wage war with Westeros. Um, well, they might. In fact, they will. That's how the Iron Bank operates. The Iron Bank, however, is owed money by um, the Iron Throne. Now, the Iron Throne itself has been destroyed, but the, the King of the Seven Kingdoms is still there. So it will be Bran that they would be going to. In, in There's also a debt that... Stannis took on. Um, where might they look to for that? I don't think John, <laughs> um, but uh, maybe they would. I mean, I don't know. It's quite hard to to say where they would th that they would look to. They would probably claim that the Iron Throne, you know, the the king down in King's Landing um, was there. I, my take is that Bran will be able to look after himself. So I think that. Any storyline which relies on John coming in and saving the Seven Kingdoms again, that 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 doesn't really work for me. Uh, I think the Seven Kingdoms is now going to be a different place, um, and I think John is not in a place where he will want to be looking down to save the Seven Kingdoms. He's done. He's done his bit already. Um, Andrew K saying many amazing stories from this universe's history with textual foundations, many with adaptations on the way that I much prefer over sequel concepts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is my uh, my overall thought on this is it, this could be good. There are ways that they could make this good. I think we've through this uh, this stream in the chat, I think we've worked our way towards something which feels like it might be able to work. But there are so many other stories. Um, I will come back to this at, at the end of the stream. But just off the top of my head, the stories that we've not even heard of being made, I would love to see one of the Regency, which is the bit which happens right at the end of Fire and Blood Part 1. I'd love to see... Blood Raven. I'd love to see the Blackfire rebellions. Um, lots of those kind of bits of history. Aegon's invasion. I would love to see. I would love to see Bravos. Um, that would be amazing. Um, so there's there's a lot out there that I think we can do without going into sequel world. Um, this is, and I I will try to only say this is the, the once because I try not to be too cynical about these things. But we've, I've already mentioned about they go, went for the safe option with House of the Dragon. They knew that this was the kind of thing that people liked, um, Targaryen's dragons. It's a safer option also for them to go with a character that people know and like. And whereas I think that the hardcore fans like us we're kind of scratching our heads and trying to work our way through how might this work? Could this even work? Do I want this to work? Um, I think if you went to casual viewers of Game of Thrones, people who enjoyed it while it was on probably didn't think they landed the ending very well, but will watch other Game of Thrones stuff in the future. If you put that to them, how about a Jon Snow spin-off? I think most of them, and certainly most of the people I've talked to in that category go... Yeah, why not? I'll give it a go. And that is, if we're being cynical, that is an easy win for HBO. A lot of these other things, um, a Yee-T anime, I think that sounds fascinating. But to the rest of the world, that means nothing. That is very niche. Um, even Duncan Egg, which we think of as being an amazing, and uh, this is all part of George R. Martin's wider world, most 
average people have not heard of Duncan Abe. Jon Snow has got name recognition already. They don't have to do anything, and people will watch it. I, so it's 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 simple. It's easy for them. Um, Train Surfer saying maybe a chance of flashbacks to his time with Igrit or similar. Igrit was a big part of his experience north of the wall. Plus, Kit might want to work with Rose again. Uh, yeah, they could do that. I, I think that there's a. If we're going down this route, I think I think it was Sydney Rose who suggested this this idea of him working through his PTSD. Yes, yeah, some flashbacks might well be. Um, on the cards because he has to work through the fact that basically if you take his story he he killed or caused the death of both of the women that he loved and that has to do something to a man and so if he is going to move on um he has to come to terms with that somehow particularly if there, if there is a love interest in some way in this then that is i think very fertile ground because what's he, what's the human reaction there for him is that i i don't want to fall in love again because every time i fall in love it goes horribly wrong and the person ends up dying um and i get hurt a lot along the way as well so there there is a lot of fertile ground ground there and yes some flashbacks could well uh work he wasn't in real time he wasn't with a greet all that long um, yes, long enough to fall in love, but it's not. We're not talking years and years here. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe some. I I don't think they will major on it, but maybe some flashbacks. Um, question from. Uh, where are we at? Tony Sled is George co-signing this show. Um, I mean, I don't know about co-signing. I th I think that the well, I'll I'll read back what he said um, because I think this is um, quite important. Um, various rumours are floating around about my involvement or lack of the same. I am involved just as I am with the other shows. Uh, Kit's team have visited me here in Santa Fe and worked with me and my own team of writers and consultants to hammer out the show. So, yes, he is he is involved. Whether it counts as being co-signed, I think, is a different matter. But it's certainly he has had an input um, and what emerges will, um, I think, he will support. Let's put it that way. Uh, Sonata Systems just saying lights, camera, action. Thank you very much. Um, uh, question from and Alan Simpson. Not to dwell on cynicism, but do you have more confidence in snow being set in a whole new time period than already exists or Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, which could step on existing lore and stories? Oh, um... I mean, confidence is a weird thing here. Um, the 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 thing with snow is that this will be going into completely new territory. If this isn't, as you say, it's not stepping on anything. They they will be inventing new story as they go, which you no. Know, you can do if you if you're having a a franchise that's what that's what they do they're doing in star wars they're not just stopping at the end of what happened at, after episode 9 they're thinking well how do we go out beyond this into the future ditto with the marvel cinematic universe and the wider marvel universe the or oh, multiverses they're, they're on now so this is it has greater potential uh, because it could go anywhere, but also, I I do, I, I retain the concern that everyone does is that on the main show, it when they started running out of material coincided with when the show started to lose a bit of its way. Um, so, yeah, in terms of rings of power, I'm not going to go all the way down that rabbit hole this time, but there 
is um, with any Tolkien adaptation, they you are working with a lot of people who care about it and know about it. It's not just George R. R. Martin. When we're talking Game of Thrones, everything's about what does George R. R. Martin think about this. With Tolkien and the world there, there's obviously Tolkien himself is dead and Christopher Tolkien, his son, who was for a long time the gatekeeper. Um, but there are other, plenty of other Tolkien experts out there. There are literal Tolkien professors. There, There is the Tolkien family who are still there and retain an active interest. Um, Tolkien Society, lots of other groups that have an interest in what's there. So it's it's a lot harder. Added to which also, when you go back to the Second Age, I said I wasn't going to go down the rabbit hole, I am. Uh, when you go back to the Second Age, you're getting into things that Tolkien did not um, necessarily come to a final um, view on in terms of his own legendarium history by which I mean you've got the Lord of the Rings we know and the Hobbit they were published in his lifetime um, what happened with all of the things afterwards including the Silmarillion is that judgment calls had to be made as to what it where what you include and what you don't include Galadriel is the classic example there's this the line in unfinished tales at the beginning of a chapter about Galadriel and Christopher Tolkien says nowhere in the the entirety of the legendarium is it harder to figure out I'm paraphrasing is it harder to figure out what's going on than with Galadriel in the in the second and third age because J.R.R. Tolkien had so many different ideas over so many different periods of time scrawled on so many different things he was uh, he was th this kind of writer who had an incredibly organized mind, but whenever he had an idea, he would just scribble it down on whatever piece of paper he had to hand. This is where famously uh, in A Hole in the Ground There Lived a Hobbit was when he was marking <laughs> marking an exam paper. The, the, the line came to him and he just sort of scribbled it down on the back of an exam paper that he was marking at the time. That was how he worked. And so when you get things like the Silmarillion, that was worked up by Christopher Tolkien going through um, drafts of stories, uh, some of which were scribbled out, literal backs of envelopes, um, essays that he wrote, letters that he wrote to uh, some people clarifying a, a point here or there, and trying to work out what what is the... Um, the best way to pull all of these things together and that means that there are some things that you have to just um accept as being this is uh, a different at different points in tolkien's development of his world um which is a quite a long and roundabout way of, of answering which do i have more confidence in i think more confidence in not trampling over established law definitely the sort of the future uh, snow idea of moving beyond this into new territory because i think it's a lot easier as well as if it does do something that we don't like then we can just say oh actually let's let's pretend that didn't happen um but the potential for greatness is probably more in the the things it, that are within the established canon if that makes sense Jamie McKenna um, saying, can't stay. Looking forward to watching back later. Honestly, I would watch The Adventures of John and Tormund, but still don't want this. Uh, cheers, moderators. Yes, moderators, thank you so much for doing uh, fantastic work uh, today, as you always do. If you are watching this live, please just share a little bit of love with the moderators. They do a wonderful job. Um, uh, but uh, just... Uh, to respond, Jamie, to what you were saying, um, I would watch The Adventures of John and Torment. I think everyone would love that there, there was a great dynamic going on there. And if you can add in ghosts, then all the better. Uh, so, yes, that would be great. I still don't want this. I think a lot of people will be saying I don't want this. And, and it's up to HBO to make something which makes us change our minds, um, frankly. Um... 
Morris Morrison saying, for me, I hope John leaves the north and travels Planetos, going from the Summer Isles to Lys and Yi Ti, all while helping the small folk, with each new city getting a traveler's guide to Westeros description. Uh, yeah, well, that sounds fun. I think, well, as an as an idea, yes, I love I, I love that, but I have a feeling that what what George R. R. Martin has said that I haven't picked up before is with all of these spin-offs. Um, excuse me, I may be about to sneeze. I'll try to <laughs> I'll try to hold it in. Um, what George R. R. Martin has said before is that these shows are all going to have different feels. So um, it's not all going to feel like Game of Thrones. Clearly, House of the Dragon has got a lot of a Game of Thrones feel to it. It's going to be a little bit darker, I suspect, but it will have that kind of feel. Some of the others will have different feel to them. Um, the Nine Voyages, the Sea Snake show, the Corlys Velaryon show, that has to be exploring going on adventures um finding out new bits about the world the wider worlds that has to be that feeling i'll get onto that in a in a moment but for me that is a simbadi kind of feel to it i think that means particularly as the nymeria show also has to have an element of movement and travel and exploring new areas to it that kind of cuts down on the possibility for Jon Snow to be also moving and exploring and discovering the world. It's a nice it, it's a nice idea, but I think that they will be trying to keep all of these shows feeling different. Um, Duncan Egg will obviously feel different, but I, I think they will want to keep these other um, live action shows feeling different from each other as well. Uh, Nicola Jurikan saying, will Brienne make an appearance? Um, she shouldn't. She's now Lord Commander of the um, King's Guard, um, so she should be guarding the King, uh, and the King should be staying in Show World, down in King's Landing, um, or possibly going to the Isle of Faces, not that they really covered the Isle of Faces on the TV show. So I don't think Brienne should. That doesn't mean they won't introduce her, but I don't think she should. Um, Cloaked one saying, John being conceivably the last Targaryen, do you think there's a possibility of Drogon making an appearance? Logically, yes. Again, this is TV show world. Whether Drogon survives in the books is another matter. Possibly, but I, I personally hope they resist it because suddenly that becomes very like Game of Thrones. I, I would want this to move on. And the moment you get Drogon coming in, this ceases to be the Jon Snow show. This becomes the Dragon's show. This becomes the Targaryen show. He He's embracing his northernness here by going north. Um, he never really embraced his Targaryenness, And I don't think... Well, personally, I don't want to... I, I don't want a show where he we're just getting dragons back. Um, I, I want I want that bit of the story to have ended. Um, I love dragons. <laughs> I'm going to get a lot of dragons in the House of the Dragon. I don't think this show should be about dragons. Um, so no, uh, a, a possibility. But I think most likely, given that Drogon hadn't bonded to John, Drogon was bonded to Danny. Drogon's just gone back to Valyria or wherever and that's it we'll never see from him again um, questions from uh, reflective rambling, rambling picking up for TWR um, saying the story of the uh, thank you very much for doing this, by the way. I do love it when people do this. Uh, the story of the Roinar and Princess Nymeria leading her people to dawn would be interesting. Sothorius and the ruins of Yin. Uh, yes, it would be interesting. I, what I was what I was wanting to do was work my way through um, the different shows and talk about them in turn. So what I will probably do is pick up on that when I'm talking about um, 
the Nymeria show, if that's okay. Um, Andrew K also not down for a Drogon cameo. Um, Andreas saying, if the character work is tight, there is no need for big spectacle set pieces and world travels. You also missed my two chunky super chats. Did I? I do apologize. Um, um, where are they? Um, perhaps moderators, you could uh, you could highlight them for me. Um, that would be really helpful. I do apologize. Uh, sometimes the chat does go so quickly. I miss the super chats, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, who wants it? Nine eight three saying, um, could John go and try and find Danny's body? I mean, he could, but is that what he wants? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I think he wants to move on. I think that that's, yeah. he, he killed her because, again, this is show, this is not books, so let's not speculate too much, but he killed her in the show because he saw that she was turning into a, a an evil dictator, basically, and it was the right thing to do. So that's why he did. Would that mean that he wants to go and find her body? Well, I don't think it does. I think that he wants to move on personally. I think he's he's got literally burned by the whole experience and he just wants to move on. So yeah, he could do it, but I don't think he will. Um, right, let's go... I'll quickly flick through, see if they've got any more questions on all of the Jon Snow stuff before um, we move on elsewhere. Um, we've got a couple of questions from my patrons. Catherine Furseth saying, uh, did you see the reports about Amelia Clark's comments? Uh, yes, I did. I talked about them a little bit earlier. It seems to me that a series content being influenced by the actors to a large extent is not a good idea. The same way I feel that Clark herself tried to underline the Danny as a saviour um, story at the expense of the more balanced story of good and evil coexisting in Danny. Any thoughts on actors deciding content? Everyone wants to be a hero at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. For those who don't know this, um, Amelia Clark um, underlining the Danny as a savior story at the expense of other elements. This actually came in that book, which I name checked earlier, the, the the Hibbard book that Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon, which was a it was a fascinating book actually. It was dubbed as like behind the scenes of Game of Thrones interviews with all of the key people. And the way it was framed was basically they went through sort of topics and then here's what the, the showrunners said, here's what George R. R. Martin said, here's what these actors said, here's what this other person said. So you can start getting a, a, a rounded view about what happened in various bits of production, in the character development and so on. This was one of the big things for me which came out of it which was looking at this issue of Daenerys at the end um, which was controversial what happened there for obvious reasons it became apparent reading um, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon that one of the elements this that made it not work not this isn't answering everything, but it's one of the elements here, was that the showrunners said to Amelia Clark several times during the run of the show something along the lines of, um, here, I want you to act Danny as being, enjoying the, uh, the damage, the fire and blood, the, uh, the destruction she's causing. This is going to build up to something later on. Um, and she very clearly and explicitly said, I did not take that note from them because, in my view, Danny as a character is a very positive character and um, she's a, a, a savior to many and she's not evil and destructive. So, her performance on screen, I'm paraphrasing by the way, her performance on screen reflects 
her view of the character rather than the the way that the showrunners wanted the character to be developing now you can dig into that a huge amount more who's to who's to blame for that should the showrunners have been clearer and stronger with her should she have have taken the advice better i'm not casting a blame i'm just saying that is clearly a thing that happens so that's a bit of the background there does this mean that actors should not generally should not have um a uh, say in character development well i don't personally i don't think that as a rule that is the way that these things should be um the if you are a good actor you should be able to um play a part which is not necessarily making your character great and wonderful all the time i have absolutely no reason to think that this is kit harrington wanting us to be having a wonderful view of Jon snow as a character it's entirely possible that he's thinking you know what i just want i'm I'm wanting a gritty part of my career. I want us to see the inner turmoil of this character. There's lots of different ways that this could go. So I understand the concern. Personally, I don't, I, I will judge it on its own merits. Um, I'm not going to take that as a a reason to dislike it. The, the fact that I, it is fascinating, the fact that he came with this idea and this is confirmed by George R. R. Martin, and he came with this as an idea. It's very clear, not just him saying this is what I'd like, but he had a team. And this is something for those who've been sort of following Kit Harrington. I mean, I'm sort of vaguely following his his career, obviously since Game of Thrones. He is moving more towards the sort of the behind the camera world, not just in terms not as a director so much as the sort of the more executive producer idea he did a uh, uh, gunpowder it was called a thing i think it was a bbc show um a, a mini series based on one of his ancestors who was in the original gunpowder um plot um uh, way back in the 17th century in the in uh, the uk and he was part of the team which pitched to this idea he was a part of the team that um uh, produced the show as well as him starring in it and I, I haven't seen it for a while it must have been three years or so ago but i can't remember looking at that thinking oh this is just him wanting a star vehicle for himself um it, it he seemed to fit in well with the the ensemble cast so i'm not i don't take it necessarily as a bad thing but um, yeah, I, I, I understand the concern. Uh, TWR saying, great work. Your traveler's guides have turned me from a casual watcher to a hardcore enthusiast. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, the uh, Yeah, for, they're, they're still available. For those who are newer to the channel, I did ages ago it was my a traveler's guide to Westeros, a series of short videos, some of like only five minutes, five, ten minutes each, uh, just going through as a traveller experiencing Westeros and Essos, what is it like actually going to these places? What does it, what does it, what does it look like? What, how does it smell? What food is available? Um, what are the people like? That kind of level of detail. Um, and I had a huge amount of fun making them and uh, people seem to have in, in, enjoyed them uh, ever since. So they're, they're not um, uh, not all you know, the most watched things I've done, but in terms of pure enjoyment, uh, right up there for me. Um, uh, you're someone in the chat. Sorry, I missed who that was pointing out. Uh, Kit Harrington does come up through theatre. Yes, a lot of actors in the UK do come up through theatre. So it's um, uh, and it, he is a good actor. Um, Kaya Spellerina saying, book only characters in snow you want to see. Um, I mean, if she survives, they didn't have her in um, the on the TV show, but someone like Val 
would be really quite good. Um, I'd love to see her on on the screen. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, book only characters who might be up in that part of the world. Um, quite a few of the uh, Night's Watchmen um, who are up there didn't. In the end, the they most of the Night's Watchmen were sort of generic on the TV show, but there's a lot of fantastic characters um, in the books. At, at Castle Black, so I'd love to see some of them. Um, I was just having a quick look to see whether I could find those uh, questions from Andreas, but I can't. I can't see them. But uh, what I will do, Andreas, is I will, um, if they don't come through to me here and this time, then I will pick them up and answer them next week. Uh, Mathieu saying, if the show focuses on healing, trauma, etc. How do you think will the tough society of the North view John dealing with these difficulties and things that could be seen as weak by them? Yeah, it's it's. This is the thing that I was I was saying is that the the difference where the Frodo analogy breaks down is that Frodo is going to a a place of healing and and kindness and love, and John is not. He's going to a very harsh environment. And whereas, yes, there will be people who will be sympathetic. And on his side, people like Tormund, it, broadly speaking, the wildling culture is a lot harder uh, than it down south. I mean, most of Westeros isn't great with things like PTSD, to be honest. So um, I think he'd find it hard to find many places where he gets a very sympathetic hearing. Um, but that that is where conflict lies, um, is if he needs something and his environment is not providing it, that's uh, that's a potential problem. Um, let's go to uh, Sasa K saying, I personally will only watch the, uh, the very much only in development Snow if the cast includes Christopher Hivu. I can never pronounce his name very well. Uh, so I can just watch his various facial expressions throughout. Um, yeah, I think that having Tormund there will be um uh make or break it that's uh it will add to the comedy in as well uh the way that they went with that character um okay so i think with that i'm going to move on to start talking about some of the other you, by all means keep the questions about uh and comments about uh john snow coming i will pick up on them but i want to talk about the other spin-offs as well just because there's there's quite a lot of them and, and i think it's we will see some of these probably not all of them but we will see some of them the sea snake formerly nine voyages um this is what um george R. martin said Bruno Heller, the creator and showrunner of Rome, is writing his pilot script for the Corliss Velaryon series. This one started out as Nine Voyages, but now we're calling it The Sea Snake since we wanted to avoid having two shows with numbers in the title. So this, um, to my mind, I'm, I'm really quite excited by this one. To my mind, this is Sinbad. The Corliss Velaryon that we see in House of the Dragon is a legend because of what he did earlier in his life traveled further than anyone in Westeros, visited places that no one had ever been to before. It came back with riches beyond um, anyone's wildest imagination. He turned House Velaryon at the beginning of House of the Dragon. House Velaryon is the richest uh, house in all of Westeros because of him. He's brought back enough uh, gems that he could build himself a massive new castle, a city grew up alongside it. It became the trading hub uh, that was taking trade away from King's Landing. This was so big and impressive. Um, he was a legend. And we get to see how this legend came to be. So that's something I'm excited about. And also the places, because we know some places that he went. And going all the way to Carth, all the way to Ashai, I mean, how good would it be to see a shy stopping off at Yi Ti, Leng, going to Sothorios? These are the kinds of things which would be amazing. This is the show which will allow us to see the breadth of George R. R. Martin's world. And 
it, it works really well. You've got nine voyages. It's just a, every one of them, you go away, explore a new place, get into some adventures, uh, hijinks ensue, uh, you come back with some amazing stories and probably a whole load of wealth. As I say, it feels like Sinbad to me, uh, and I love the Sinbad stories. So that is something I'm uh, really looking forward to. And Bruno Heller, it has to be said of the writers that... George R. R. Martin name checks um, for developing these things. He is a fan of Rome. He's talked about this several times, so he he clearly likes Bruno Heller's writing. The fact that we're told specifically that the pilot script is being written, I think a decision will be made on this one quite soon. It's clearly been in development for a while. This is this was one of the earliest things that we were told about. So this has now been a few years in development. It's either going to go ahead or it's not. Um, so I I would expect an announcement maybe sometime this year, later this year, maybe at the end of House of the Dragon, we will get an announcement on what's happening with this one because you can't keep on getting rewrites of something as much as they might want it um, to work. If, if they're now, George R. Martin says, on third rewrites you can't keep on with that and at some point you have to realize if you're flogging a dead horse it's not going to work so i think a decision will be made on this i have a feeling this one may well be one of the ones that goes ahead particularly if the audience reacts positively to Corlys Velaryon in house of the dragon that may well be the thing which tips it one way or the other if it's clear that there's a fascination with the the character with the backstory then i think that um this they they may well go ahead with this um let's just have a quick look in the chat um uh, just see if there's anyone else talking about the um uh college valerian show not Hugely Martin S is saying, who do you think is the most good, i.e. least evil role in Game of Thrones? It does not seem to be a franchise with pure good roles. I'd probably say Davos, but uh, many would probably say the Starks. Well, I mean, I think the two characters who are portrayed by George R. R. Martin as most unambiguously good are Sam and Brienne. And um, Brienne is set up as a true knight not actually technically a knight but she is set up as upholding all of the knightly virtues so th she is one of these true characters and another being sam is uh, he's not created as a hero in a classical sense but his heart is in the right place and and he does grow he's actually uh, i mean having recently reread book one of Game of Thrones, he, he starts out always talking about how cowardly he is, um, and you kind of feel sympathy for him, but you don't think, wow, yeah, this is a great character. He grows on you quite a lot, does uh, Sam. Um, okay, let's go to talk about 10,000 ships. This is what George R. Martin says. Uh, Amanda Siegel, uh, our showrunner, has delivered a couple of drafts on that one, and we are forging ahead. So again, this one seems quite positive at the moment. Um, I think this is one of those ones that a lot depends on how big they want it to be. And Creative Branches over on Patreon has a question um, that... That sort of sums up a lot of this, I think, saying, I'm excited for these mysterious cities. E.T. and Troyane are top of my list. I think there's enough room here for new writers to breathe and make something really cool. Um, for 10,000 ships, how much of the ancient ruin do you think we'll see before the dragons arrive? How much of the Valyrian freehold do you think the show will rush to dawn? So this, I think, is the, the, the key to how they play this, because the story of... Nymeria, 10,000 ships, is potentially quite long. 
you could start with and and you should i think start with the the reason why there are 10,000 ships heading off from the river roin to try and find a new home and and that is because there's been a war now you could start with the ships just heading out um in a kind of um i don't know battlestar galactica way they did um pardon me they they did in Battlestar Galacta try and show, particularly in the reboot version, try and show a little bit of what happened. But basically, you're going straight into here's a ragtag fleet fleeing a disaster, trying to find a new home. That is the kind of feel that they might go for. But they could have an entire first season building up to that exodus. They could have uh, battles between the uh, the Valyrian freehold and the the Rhoynish. You could have Prince Garin. You could have the start of the Curse of Grayscale happening there and then. We we could see that in this show. Um, then they go. Nymeria and the Ten Thousand Ships don't all just go straight over to Dawn. They spend a long time. I think three years. They're stopping off at various places. They go to. Basilisk Isles, they go to Sunset Isles, Thorios. Um, some of them stop off um, the step stepstones. Um, and when they arrive at dawn, it's not all of them. They've lost a lot of people along the way. And then once they've arrived, they have to integrate themselves. They have to, there's a whole load of political alliances. They forge an alliance with the Martells. They then, um, basically attack the rest of dawn and subdue the rest of dawn and make themselves uh with the martel family which um uh, nymeria marries into that becomes the ruling family of all dawn before that there were lots of smaller competing families so you could cut this in lots of different ways you you have to if you're calling it ten thousand ships you have to have at some point you have to have those ships but you you could have the end point of them arriving in dawn if you want to that could be and and the, the story is the exodus it's the battlestar galactus story when they reach the final the promised land and then that's the end they burn the ships just to make sure they're never going anywhere else you could end it there if you wanted to or you could almost start it there that have an entire show about dawn there are lots of different ways you can get. I would love this to be the long story because I'm the bit of this I'm most fascinated by, it has to be said, is the chance, as you're hinting at here, the chance to see a little bit of the Valyrian freehold and a little bit of Rhoynish society when it was great. Um, I think that would be amazing. The Troy Rain, um, which becomes Sorrows, uh, the start of Grayscale, all of that I would love to see. Um, so yeah, there is the potential for me. There is the potential for this to cover some really interesting stuff. Uh, Matthias saying, "I would love to at least have one season of Dawn Civil War." Um, yep, I would too. I would love it to cover the whole um, the whole period of time, right from the very beginning all the way through to the end of it. Um, Astra Inclinant saying, watering down will be the death of a song of ice and fire, I fear. George R. R. Martin criticised the lack of Aragorn's tax policy, and now he's adding in every pointless piece of trivia while neglecting his own ending. It's looking grim. Well, he is still writing it. Um, I'm, I'm remaining positive about the main story. Um, and if he's going back to Tyrion, I'm taking that as good news. I like Tyrion. Uh, and if he's getting more chapters, then I'm very pleased about it. Um, Carlos Bellarino saying, I wonder if any of this could shed some light on what Arya experiences after Game of Thrones. Yeah, I've got a question I know about that a bit later. Um, my take is that it's possible that they include her in um, uh, as a sort of a cameo in the Jon Snow show. Uh, but I don't think I don't think they're going to have a an Arya show uh, in and of itself. Um Cloaked one saying, I think burning the ships was great symbolically speaking, however, certainly a little bit of preemptive. 
Imagine if our world's explorers had done that with their ships, they'd be dead within the year. This is um, also a nod to Tolkien. George R. R. Martin does this so much. Incidentally, if you're interested in George R. R. Martin's nods to Tolkien, I did one of my collaborations with the fantastic history of West Westeros, um, I don't know, a month or so ago, was looking at one chapter uh, of A Song of Ice and Fire and quite how many nods um, that George R. R. Martin does make to um, Lord of the Rings. This is another one. This is a, a bit way back in the history of uh, Tolkien's Legendarium when the Noldor elves, uh, Fëanor and Sons, uh, sail back across to, to Middle-earth off on this uh, great vow to reclaim the Silmarils and burn the ships symbolically. Um, there's lots of consequences of that, but this are, is George R. R. Martin, I'm sure, doing a nod to that because it, this is them saying symbolically saying we're not going back, and and it is it, it's going to be some great bit of uh, imagery going. Um, in fact, of rambling, picking up from Matthew Stewart, thank you, saying my question is how much magic and monsters could we see in Nymeria, Krakens and such? A lot, <laughs> potentially, because the places that they went to. Well, let me backtrack. In the second, the end bit in Dawn, probably not much. But early on, the the battles that we had between the Roynish people and the Valyrian freehold, they had water mages. They they had um, the, using water magic against dragons, which would be amazing to see if they do that. You have the sorrows, the creation of the sorrows, bringing the mist. Uh, up drowning the city, uh, the flooding the river. This is high fantasy indeed going on there. Then when you get the journeys, they go to a lot of places that are just um, very mysterious. <laughs> and they uh, uh, there's whole groups of them just disappear in haunted old cities abandoned cities um they get dreadful diseases they go to some horrific places before they end up in dawn dawn must have felt like actually this is as safe as we're going to get even though we have to go and invade and attack the entire country so a lot in the first half the second half not so much so uh, Krakens and such, yeah, we could do. Um, I don't think off the top of my head, I don't think we get a specific mention of them in um, Nymeria's story in, in as much as we have it, which is in the world of ice and fire. But um, effectively, I'm being saying, if you haven't shouted it out, it's Andrew Kay's name day. Andrew Kay. Happy name day, uh, one of my moderators uh, and a stalwart and fine fellow. Um, if you're in the chat, can you show him some love and, and wish him a very happy birthday? I'm, I'm sure, well, I hope he's had a fantastic day. I hope he is having a fantastic day. Andrew, thank you. My very best wishes to you for, for having a, a, a wonderful day. I hope you have some nice cake or, or treat yourself to something. Um, uh, yes, happy name day. I must, uh, I must keep a grid of moderator's name days um let's um see um one more question from martin s i agree about the nod to feanor burning the ships but it occurred to me that aragorn burned the fleet of umber decades before lord of the rings um he, yes he did so the the difference it's a difference of intent here there's one thing, this is my interpretation anyway, one thing going to your enemies and burning your enemy's fleet, which happens a lot in history. It's another when you burn your own fleet uh, because you're saying, I'm never going to use that again. And that's the symbolism of the 10,000 ships. That's why it's, it's so important is that Nymeria burns them and says, we're not traveling anymore. We're not going anywhere else. This is our home. We're not moving anywhere. And for a, a people that come from, uh, it's a river culture. 
that's a, it's a riverside culture. Their life was based around the river. And then they'd been on these boats moving from place to place for years. And then they arrive at this arid, desolate land. It's a huge culture shock. And then their leader just says, we're not moving. This is it. That is a hugely symbolic. And, and that's why, yeah, as you say, a, a nod to Feanor. Um, let's talk about Duncan Egg. So Duncan Egg... It's obviously much loved series of books. Series, we've only got three still. Um, George R. Martin said the third of the live action shows is the Duncan Egg series, helmed by Steve Conrad. My team and I have had some great sessions with Steve and his team, and we really hit it off. He's determined to do a faithful adaptation of the stories, which is exactly what I want. These characters and stories are very precious to me. The first season will be an adaptation of the first novella, The Hedge Knight. So um, that's all very positive. The history to this is that George R. R. Martin, way back in 2016, when he was pitching the ideas to HBO about all these thousands of stories that they could do in his world, um, he actually specifically said, and Duncan Egg would be great, but that's probably more of like a feature length um, uh, show her story rather than a season he specifically said that and that's my instinct as well is that these stories they work better as um one-offs the, the example i've used a few times now is the sherlock series from a few years ago the benedict cumberbatch martin freeman one they had the stories which were as long as they needed to be, an hour, hour and a half, and they didn't worry about having massively long seasons. They just did as many episodes as they wanted to each time, three or whatever, and that worked. The, the, clearly, there was a, an overarching plot, but it wasn't, that wasn't the main thing. Each, each story was a standalone story. That was how I envisage, and still envisage, uh, Duncan Egg working best. This idea of them being in seasons is, is an interesting one. George R. Martin is clearly bought into it. Uh, I've no idea. I, I have to take him at his word that um, they've had some great sessions um, and that he's determined to do a faithful adaptation. Um, so I will have to take him at his, at his word for that. Um, and also we have to say, okay, so a season, what does that mean? That that could range from anything from um, six half-hour episodes up to 20-hour-long episodes. A season could be anything. So I don't know how it will look. But a faithful adaptation has to feel like Duncan Egg, which is a very different feel to Game of Thrones. So the casting will be absolutely essential for this, particularly the casting of Dunk. Andrea Quaid over on Patreon saying, who do you think would be a good casting for Dunk? I'm, I, I'd am i love to know what you think in the chat, or if you're watching back later, put a comment down. Um, because I, I've been having a lot of fun trying to think, because Dunk is such a very particular character. The whole thing relies on us buying into Dunk as this, um, a true knight, not particularly clever, uh, Dunk the Lunk, because of Castle Wall, he's, but at the same time, true-hearted and very confident, uh, competent and very um, loving and caring. So we have to buy into that character. The character of Egg will come through more in the, the three stories we've got. Yes, he's, he's a good character, but it's more about Dunk. I... And the other thing, of course, he has to be tall. He He's Sir Duncan the Tall, um, seven foot tall. It's quite a limited pool of actors. Now, Tom Hopper, you may know if you watch Umbrella Academy, um, and he also did appear in Game of Thrones. He was um, Dickon, uh, the name that Bron kept on sniggering at, um, Dickon Tarly. Uh, he he is very tall, um, and he can do that kind of slightly simple 
um, uh, character quite well. So that, that that would be my pick. But um, I'd love to know what other people think, and also wh- how you feel about the the Duncan Egg uh, show. It's it's something that's very close to all of our hearts, and so I think we've got a very clear idea in our mind of what it should look like, and so um, I think we're all a bit nervous. I should I should say this i'm i'm feeling confident that this is going to go forward i think i said yes the uh, the nine voyages one i think probably will i think this is the the most likely out of all of the live action ones that we've seen more likely than john snow even they want this to work george r r martin wants this to work this is the one which is based most closely on the books that I think they will make this work somehow. I think we will see this. Um, and the other thing, before I dive into the comments on this one, the other thing is this is obviously dependent on George R. R. Martin writing more of them. He's only written three, um, and he said he wants their the, the stories to go all the way up to the end of their lives, which takes us up to the tragedy at summer hall which i'd love to see um so the good news i think is that perhaps this might spur him on to write some more duncan egg stories quite quickly he has name checked that when he was doing his big update at the beginning of the year and he was saying everything's now a priority for me um, he did name check possibility of doing a little bit more on Duncan Egg. We know that Duncan Egg Four he had he did make a start on um, She Wolves of Winter. Um, so She Wolves of Winterfell, sorry. Um, so the it shouldn't and they're only novellas, so it shouldn't take too long for him to do. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm hopeful that we might get more. Duncan Egg content out of this. Um, Astra England saying, I know that Summer Hall is going to make me cry if we ever see or read it. Yeah, I think same here. Uh, Mathieu saying, so we have it confirmed that it won't be animated. We have it confirmed that the project being developed at the moment is live action, not animated. Yes, there was a rumour a couple of years ago that this was going to be one of the animations, but um, no, the, what they're doing at the moment is definitely a live action one. Um, Andrew K saying, I love Duncan Egg, just worry that they will eat up the source material too quickly and won't resist the urge to surpass it. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely with this. I don't want them to go beyond whatever George R. R. Martin has written. But the because this is over a lifetime, the the fact that we may have to wait a few years, I'm not that worried about because the Dunkers are a young knight and egg as his squire uh, a boy that is probably only going to be the first four or five of these stories it's, we had the first three and then we have to go on to when he becomes king and we have the stories there going up to summer hall where they're a lot older um so they will probably have to recast the characters at some point anyway so i'm not I'm not worried. In fact, I'd be very happy if they made three now and then just paused and waited for George R. R. Martin to write his next ones and then just keep on creating them when a new one comes along. I do not want them to do something um, uh, that is uh, get, getting ahead of the writing on this one. And I think they would be wary of that as well. Stephanie Frederick saying Tom Cruise pulled off Reacher. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want Tom Cruise. Um, um, let's have a quick look. Any more? Uh, Sasa K saying I want age appropriate dude for Dunk, so uh, so they'll cast a thirty-five year old for a guy who's twenty, possibly. Yeah, I mean, I want that as well. An, an un an unknown might be best as Carl. St- Carson Mark says an unknown might be best of all. No baggage that way. Yeah, I, it would work well. Um, uh, so Tom Hopper's getting a little bit of love. Um, 
so and reflective around me saying he was also in Merlin. Yes, he was. I mean, I mean, the more I'm thinking about it, the more these are a bit um yeah, they might be a bit too old for him. Uh, but maybe slightly older <laughs> dunk would work. Um okay, let's let's move on. So my my take is that I'm excited by this. I think this will happen, but it has to be right. Um and this is obviously the one that is closest. They can stick closest to the source material. What we've got across the piece here is a range now of things that um, George R. R. Martin's uh, original material, uh, well, sorry, a range from things that are, can be almost word, word for word and scene for scene adaptations, which is what Duncan Egg can be, all the way through to we've got absolutely nothing to go on, which is where the Jon Snow show is. So that's the range that we've got. And House of the Dragon is this first step away. Yes, they seem to be very much sticking to what George R. Martin has written, but without sort of breaking it to you, 90% of the dialogue is going to be original dialogue, not from George R. R. Martin. Um, and then the deeper into it you get, the more they were bits of leeway. There was uh, um, a lot more information about what happens in the season one um, part of the the show than there is in some of the later seasons if they're going to pad it out to five or six seasons which is what it's looking like they may do uh, but that has got a reasonable amount of source material when you go to Nymeria you will find we've got a few pages when you go to the sea snake a page maybe of material about what he where he went and what happened not huge amounts at all so we, we start moving even further away and then we get to the animated shows and we've only got information about one of these animated shows which is the yt show which is going to be called the golden empire apparently uh, and that we have almost nothing to go on almost nothing there there is a section in the world of ice and fire about yt but it's very high level and all of the characters apart from maybe one or two if they can scrape them together will be completely new so this is uh, moving even further away this is not going to feel like game of thrones this is going to feel hopefully still something within George R. R. Martin's world, but it is going to be very different. Um, what George R. R. Martin said about it is our working title is The Golden Empire. We have a great young writer on that one too, and I think the art and animation is just going to be beautiful. I would tell you more if I could. Um, I don't think I can say a word about the other animated shows, not yet. So the... Uh, to, to be clear, these are these are shows. The, own, the the fact that we've only got a title for one of them does imply that the others are probably quite early on in development. Um, and there are two or three other animated shows that we don't know much about yet. Now, there's not huge amounts to, to be said. I don't. Uh, Think about uh, Lady Eternal says I'm intrigued by the idea of Yeet spin-off since it is one of the Planetosi regions that George R. Martin has written very little about thus far. What do you think the premise of the series will be, and what, if anything, are you hoping for from it? Well, what I'm hoping is hoping for is a different part of this world, uh, because the way that the world of Ice and Fire was written was from the perspective of the Maesters. And the further away from Westeros you go, the less they know, and the more um, wild, uh, uncivilized they try and make it feel. This, I. Um, but the hints are, I should say, the hints are that this is probably the most civilized place. This is where civilization started. 
There are Lomas Longstrider apparently talks about cities buried beneath cities buried beneath cities, that even their ruins are more impressive than cities in Westeros. This is a hugely impressive place. So we should be looking at the equivalent of like Ming Dynasty China. So what I would love is some just a, a hint of all of that wonder. I would love something that has a feel of, I don't know, Crouching Tiger or something like that, um, which has a, a hint of the magical to it, but also quite grounded. That's the kind of idea of what I would like for this. But this is expanding the world out. Beyond that, I don't know. It's, it's completely... Um, at the the whim of the writers and George R. R. Martin is he chooses his words carefully he says it's looking like it's going to be beautiful I've got a great writer he doesn't say anything really about the story here he doesn't say what the characters are he, he could do but he's he's focusing more at this stage on the sort of the concept art and the quality of the writing which is fine um it sounds like it's good, and we will hear more about it in uh, in time, I'm sure. Um, uh, Google Bits saying it'll be a parody of feudal Japanese and ancient Chinese stories, possibly. Um, uh, Philip says, hopefully House of the Dragon fails so they never make more awful spin-offs. Um, what are they thinking? Nobody wants this. Nobody asked for this. Just finish the books, George. Well, I hope he finishes the books, but I also hope that House of the Dragon is brilliant because I I, I love this world and I love to uh, love to see things in it. Um, Alan Simpson saying, I wonder if the Yeeti thing will be presented as what actually went on there or what the Maesters believed happened there. I hope it's what actually happened, not what the Maesters believed, because I, if George R. Martin is wanting this to be having different feels, all each show to have a different feel, part of this, I would hope, takes us out from this Westerosi-centric worldview and actually... Um, makes us inhabit a worldview that's different. What does what does the world look like from a different perspective? Well, their history of the Long Night would be completely different to what uh, the history of the Long Night is in Westeros. I'm sure many of the same things happened, but their stories are slightly different. We hear bits of that in the world of Ice and Fire, but um, the, the feel has to be different. I don't want this to be what the Maesters tell us about. I, I don't want a random, effectively Western character coming in there so that we can all feel a little bit uh, oh, what, I understand this because I'm seeing it through their eyes. I want to be immersed in that world. That's my personal take anyway. Um, Carl Karsnock saying, Golden Empire kind of sounds like an all-you-can-eat Chinese bu uh, buffet. Well, um, it, it is, this is, but it's also this, it's an incredibly unhelpfully vague, for those of us trying to speculate on these things, unhelpfully vague, because the Golden Empire could refer to anything in the period of time in that part of the world since the long night um the great empire of the dawn that all of that could be called the golden empire so you could set it at any point in time um okay so we've got some um animes coming i also want to talk a little bit about the harren hall stage play for those who have not heard about this because this as i say this is one of the things that i am Personally, most excited about, um, but it's all gone a bit quiet uh, on. We heard about this, I, I'm going to say, two years ago, something along those lines. And this is what George R. R. Martin said at the time. The seeds of war are often planted in times of peace. Few in Westeros knew the carnage to come when highborn and small folk alike gathered at Harrenhal to watch the finest knights of the realm compete in a great tourney during the year of the false spring. It is a tourney oft referenced during Game of Thrones and in my novels. And now, at last, we can tell the whole story on the stage. And then the official blurb says... 
The play will, for the first time, take audiences deeper behind the scenes of a landmark event that previously was shrouded in mystery, featuring many of the most iconic and well-known characters from the series. The production will boast a story centered around love, vengeance, madness, and the dangers of dealing in prophecy, in the process revealing secrets and lies that have only been hinted at until now. So, I love this idea. First of all, I, I, I love the theatre and I love plays and so the idea of bringing this world to the stage I think should be fantastic um and George R. R. Martin in the past has said when he's been asked about the tourney at Harren Hall he has, has said you could write a book about all of the things that happened at the tourney at Harren Hall indeed you could write a George R. R. Martin length book about all the things that happened at the Tony at Harren Hall. Lots of things happened. We have got a million different subplots going on. You could just pick out one strand. Yes, we know about the Night of the Laughing Tree. What's going on with Eris um, and his concerns about um, Rhaegar? What's what's going on with uh, Jamie Lannister? Um, we get all of the, the Starks. We get Howland Reed coming in there. We've got so much um just to unpack it's it's um i do worry how they're going to fit all of it into a stage play to be honest but um it's gone quiet is my concern and i'm talking about it here this is not part of his deal as far as we can tell with hbo this is a separate thing he's not mentioned it in his big updates or any of his other random updates that he's been doing and uh, my concern is that there are a lot of things here. You cannot do a, a half job on the Tony at Harren Hall. You have to re reveal some secrets. You have to show a bit of what happened. And I do wonder whether George R. R. Martin, having got excited and agreed to this, wants to get the Winds of Winter out first but so that he can reveal things through the books rather than through a stage play so that's my concern that maybe the reason we haven't heard anything from it is that he's actually holding off because he doesn't want that to happen until he's finished the book and the book is now going a bit slower than it was before and wasn't going at light speed before um but the when it does happen and it was originally slated for 2023, which is still possible. Um, when it does happen, we're going to see young versions of all of the main characters, as well as a clear understanding of Rhaegar and Lyanna and what happened there, and Howland Reed and what his agenda was, uh, and what on earth was going on with the Shara Dane, um, and what what Ned Stark was like as a as a young lad. Lots of these things. We we may well even see a little a hint of Littlefinger going on. This is um, uh, th the amount of answers we will get from this will be astonishing. Uh, Stephanie Frederick saying, I want to see it as a mini series. Yeah, I understand that. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, Speaking of Harren Hall, the location, uh, the glimpse we got of it in House of the Dragon looks amazing. Yes, absolutely. Um, we will get a flashback to um, the uh, Great Council, which happened. At Harren Hall in House of the Dragon, and the imagery they've got, uh, we have to give a hat tip, I think, to Mark Simonetti, who's one of the great Game of Thrones, a Song of Ice and Fire artists. They, the the concept art is clearly influenced by his work uh, to a very uh, very strong degree, and in my mind, that's an excellent thing. Although um, I'm not sure that he's getting the credit for it, so I'm trying to spread the word. Um. Matthew Stewart saying, Howland is my favourite from that bit. Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Um, uh, learning more about Howland Reed. He's so mysterious. I would love to get a bit more. Um, 
Uh, how Sanchez saying, I, I've got a question. Do you think Robert Baratheon ever knew or asked how Liana died? If he was truly in love, don't you think he would have asked how she died? Yeah, I'm sure that he did. And I'm sure that Ned told her that she died of a fever or something along those lines, which was true. Um, and uh, he wouldn't want to make up um, lies that are too far from the truth. Uh, Robert Baratheon was distracted. Yes, he was madly in love, but he was also distracted by the fact that he was injured and he'd uh, just won a civil war and he had to set up a, his own uh, kingship and he had to appoint people and make big decisions about who to trust and who not to trust. Um, the fact that Ned came back and told him that she was dead was the main thing, rather than him quizzing her on exactly how. Um, agree. We're, we're saying they probably have to get past the reveal in the books before they do the tourney at Harren Hall. Yeah, I mean, that's my fear. Um, uh, okay, so let's go to, I think, so I think that with that, I will wrap up talking about the stage play. You have my fears on this. I, I'm most excited out of everything. This is the thing I'm most excited about. But um, I have my fears that we're not going to see it for a while. Um, I've got... Um, uh, oh, actually, just a couple of things from my patrons on this. Uh, Andrew Quaid saying, I'm most excited for Duncan Egg and the tourney at Harren Hall. Do you think George R. Martin will reveal more of what happened there through Howland Reed? Absolutely, Yes. Uh, Bear Island saying, I uh, hope you and Dan are well. Thank you, we are. That's my dog, Dan. Your Howland Reed theory makes me think of Paris from Greek mythology. Assuming uh, you're correct, I imagine Howland as Blood Raven's inside man at Harren Hall with advice on getting a Shara Dane as a prize, a little like Aphrodite bribing Paris with Helen of Troy. What a stage, while a stage play might glaze over Howland's greater activities, I was curious what, if, ever, if anything, you think we'll get. Yeah, so that's a. A, a fascinating extra level that I I'd not engaged with really when I was coming up with my working hypotheses on what Howland Reed's role uh, is in the whole backstory here. Him being an agent of Bloodraven, I I personally think that's pretty well established now. Um, the the fact that he got together with Ashara Dane, um, I'm reasonably confident on the, the, whether there's the link there that she was the prize, uh, the Blood Raven sort of like got her for him. Um, I, I mean, partly I, I get into that because Blood Raven can be very manipulative, but at the same time, the maybe it's just the romantic in me likes the idea that the most beautiful woman at the ball went for the best person not just the the knight in shining armor that's the that's the hint of when we get barristan selmy when looking back at it when he's like say, he thinks of daenerys as being a bit like ashara dane and then he talks about how um Daenerys doesn't, a mud man wouldn't be good enough for her. And it's like, that's a, effectively saying um, a mud man, Howland Reed, is the match for uh, Ashara Dane. So th the, the link is there. Um, but yeah, uh, the idea that this might be all an extra layer of Blood Raven manipulation to make Howland do his thing by getting Ashara Dane as the prize. I don't like it. I wouldn't put it past Blood Raven. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, I'm off, just got back here from work uh, for birthday. See you all next time. Uh, have a wonderful birthday celebration, Andrew. Um, let's go to 
a few i've got a few sort of overarching questions from my patrons so now's a good time to drop any other random questions you've got or thoughts in into the chat i'll try and pick up as many of them as i can uh mara lee uh your super chat from earlier saying a show of uh, immense love and support hugs to your gorgeous dog dan Thank you so much for the fabulous content and stories on both your channels and the great merch. Thank you very much, uh, Mara. I would be interested in an Arya Stark adventure on the high seas. The writers could have Arya visit west of Westeros, etc. That would make for a great limited series. Uh, yeah, I think it, if you're just thinking in terms of following up to the TV show, because I don't know whether that's where Arya is going to end up in the book. I think there's a... There are a few possibilities of where she might end up in the book. Um, but if we're thinking just within the bounds of the TV show, yeah, I think if we're going to do a spin off that into the future, a sequel that does work for me, what is West of Westeros? The, the problem is how to make that feel different to the Corlys Velaryon series, The Sea Snake because that's him sailing around the world. And this will be Arya sailing around the world. And then we've also got Nymeria sailing from uh, Essos over to Westeros, that they start to feel a little bit samey. So um, there's no hint that this is in the works, but I could understand it. Um, it just seems as if what happened was that Kit Harrington came with an idea and pitched it, and people liked it enough to be developing it, and other members of the cast haven't. Um, so, it, I mean, we have to remember. I think a lot of this does rely on what the what those actors want to do with their time. Amelia Clark, it appears, wants to move on. Um, she's done that now. She's done Game of Thrones. Fair play to her. That's a that is the thing which she will be remembered for for a very long time. Um, but she wants to move on and see whether she can get remembered for other things as well. Kit Harrington is clearly trying and doing other bits and being successful. And he's, he's part of Marvel world now as well, Marvel Universe as well. But he clearly thinks that he, there's more that he wants to do with the character of Jon Snow. And so this is on a an actor by actor basis. I, I imagine that a lot of the main actors will be happy to move on. Um, not because they hated the experience of being on Game of Thrones. I'm sure they all recognize wh whether or not they had good or bad personal ex experiences. I, I'm sure they all recognize how important it was for their career. But um, I think most have given the ind indications that they did quite like to sort of move on to other things. Maybe some cameos, maybe not. Um, Johnny Targs, I feel like where the show went wrong was it ran out of source material from George R. R. Martin. And I feel like the Blood Moon prequel did not happen because, again, there was a lack of source material. George R. R. Martin has written so much in-depth history for this world. Um, I do not want to see HBO try to run with any story on their own. Stick to the source material like Game of Thrones season one to four, and the shows will do fantastic, both from a quality perspective and viewership perspective. Um, yeah, I think, so just to pick up on Blood Moon in that, then this was, and George R. R. Martin did say very clearly that this was going beyond his own um world that he'd built there there was the the writing there had to just create extra new law um and he didn't really give the impression that he was nervous or upset about that but he definitely he noted it as a as a thing that was happening um there there are lots of things that lots of parts of this world that we could have great stories from the issue is that they they don't just want it all feeling the same they want things being quite different so as much as i would love there to be a regency tv show based on what happened after the dance of the dragons uh, the next few years because i think there's some fantastic stories in there i actually doubt we'll get that because that will be a third story about King's Landing and Targaryens and dragons. Um, and I think that they, 
that they want to move on from that, that we will have House of the Dragon, that will give us our fill of it, and then we'll go off and have adventures on the high seas. We'll go over to far parts of E.T. And, and, and immerse in a different culture. We'll head far north of the wall and have something uh, with John State. They, they want things which will be different, which will feel different. So um, the there is the source material, but they will probably deliberately be wanting to start moving beyond that. So I entirely understand the the fear here, and it is fear. I've got, I've got the same fear. Um, the 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 fear that the show start that it did. In my view, the show did start going um, in wrong ways when it veered away from what George R. R. Martin had been, but. One thing I would urge people is do not prejudge any of the spin offs that we've been talking about by Game of Thrones, the TV show, and what happened there, because these will be run by different people. And it's not just like, oh, it's the same thing. Look what happened with Game of Thrones. This is going to happen there. They are all, they've got different people heading them up. The, the closest team as far as i can tell to the original team it actually is the house of the dragon team because they've got uh, ryan condal and miguel sapochnik who were involved in the original show but not they weren't the showrunners the other ones seem to have completely new people helming them that this isn't going to be the same um uh, they're not going to have the same problems. They, that doesn't mean they're not going to have different problems, but they're not going to have the same problems is my take on it. Um, and moving away from the material that we have gives them freedom to do stuff uh, as well as um, giving them freedom to get stuff wrong. Mara Lee saying, uh, I'd like to see a series perhaps of the first long night. It doesn't have to be live action, but it'd be great to see it as an anime show about the others, the children of the forest and the first men. Yeah, so what? one of the things which is fascinating me with all of this was um, that there, we have at least two, possibly three animes that we haven't got any more information on. Hopefully we'll get some more information at some point soon. But what are they? What are they going to be on? the The beauty of animes is that you can uh, you can let your imagination go wild. So going over to a completely different, they don't have to build a massive new lot of sets for uh, for Yi They don't have to go to a film it in in China or wherever. They can just make the animation. Similarly. They've got other another couple of animes there. What could they do? I yes, I agree. I would love to see the first long night. I do wonder though whether a way to do this is not to try to write the law. This and if, if I had to do a pitch for this to, to HBO, this is what I'd do. Is this isn't about writing the law, filling in the gaps. This is telling the stories. This is telling the legends. Having um, a series of, if you could imagine a series of animes based on old man's tales um, or legends of the Age of Heroes or something like that, that would work perfectly for me. And it's not, if they're presented as these are stories within the wider story, then. I don't think we have any problems with law at all because because we we stick to it and the way that somebody tells it through the oral tradition allows them to embellish things and things to um, be slightly different from maybe what was on the written page but as long as it keeps to the spirit of it then that works well so that that's what one of the things I'd like to see and that is how I think we can get around this idea of the first long night by just telling the stories, by just telling the tales. I think we will get through the main a Song of Ice and Fire, hopefully. We will get some sort of explanation for what happened. But I'd love to see those two. I'd like to see the ice spiders. 
Um, Alex B saying George R. Martin did not seem involved enough with Blood Moon and very little source material to draw from. Um, yeah, I I wish I got the quotes up about from him about it. He he was always very positive about it, um, and he liked the vision, but he was always very clear that this is not his writing. Um, so I think comparing the way that he was talking about that with how he's talking about, say, House of the Dragon, it's very clear that he is much more bought into House of the Dragon than he ever was for um, uh, Blood Moon. But I, I don't think, um, I don't know, maybe this is a matter of time in in the sense that he has changed his mind partly i think because he's signed that contract maybe he has to now reprioritize but he has changed his mind back in the the late days of game of thrones he very clearly had taken a hands-off approach to the tv show and i think that probably moved into his approach to blood moon which was the first of these to be developed to a point where it could be a thing and so I think that at that stage, his mind was, I'm going to just let this be. I'll let the, I, I will say my bit. I will tell them all the information that they need, but then I will take a step back. That has shifted. That is not where he's at now. He is now very much the guardian of the law and canon in everything here that we've been talking about. So... Yes, I think you're right. He wasn't as involved. I don't think that means he didn't like it. Um, but um, his stance has definitely changed. Uh, George saying there was an interview from George R. Martin a while ago where he said it would have been more appropriate for 9 to 11 seasons. How would you roughly structure the remaining seasons if there were, say, 10? Um, of... Uh, uh, Game of Thrones, I assume you're talking about. I mean, yeah, at some point he even said 13, I think. Um, in terms of how would I structure it? Well, I mean, some some of it, there are, there are a couple of issues, one of which he talked about a lot, which was the butterfly effect of decisions taken early on, taking out characters and, and leaving out storylines like Dawn or Fagon. Um, if you add them back in early on, then you get a bigger, broader story, and I think better story later on. And the second thing is just not to rush it. Um, there were many issues with season eight, but the fact that it was the action was rushed, um, it just felt forced. They they never they didn't we didn't see them traveling anywhere. They just like went from being now I'm over here, now I'm over here. Um, uh, now I'm in a relationship with Brienne. Now I'm not in a relationship with Brienne. Um, John, John and Danny got together in the very last episode of season, the, the pretty much the last scene of the last episode of season seven or whatever. I think season eight, by the end of the first episode, John knew that she was his aunt. So they had less than an episode of them actually being together which is not enough for one of the most important relationships in the entirety of the story less than an episode is not an and it wasn't even like they had a whole episode focusing on they had like one scene i think so that was not enough um it was rushed so what would i would do? i would just slow down a lot of it i would make some changes earlier on um, and a little bit more attention to detail, perhaps. But anyway, that's let's not get too much bogged down to season eight. Yes, I think if we had another few seasons, it could have, it could have been a better. Um, all else being the same, um, let's go to a question from Lady Pushkins saying. 
Personally, I'd love a prequel involving Blood Raven's journey and Robert's rebellion to tell the full story behind the Tower of Joy, a Shara Dane story, etc. I understand until the books are completed, those stories would be too spoilery. Basically, I'd love episodes telling the backstories of some of the characters we've grown to love and be fascinated by. Yeah, I agree. And I think some of it we will get from things like the stage play, assuming that happens. Um, most of it we will get through the books. Um, but this is a good point. If you've got something you think you would love to see a spin off, put it in the chat and I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll shout it out because the there are many things. I think the Blood Raven story I would love. I'm you know I'm fascinated by Blood Raven, but I think it would make for a great story. The problem is that that then overlaps with the Duncan Egg story because he will be a central part in what happens with Duncan Egg. Um, uh, whether they're willing to have, to show stories that you see it from two different directions, I don't know. Um, but I would love to see that. Aegon's Invasion, I would love to see. I said it earlier, but Bravos as a place, I, th I think the potential there for a, an amazing story is is um, huge because you've got things that we all know and we know about the faceless men we know about the iron bank um, we've we've got an idea of what it's like this kind of like canalsy place um, the sea lord we understand that the politics it's, it's not mentioned all that much but Bravosi politics would be absolutely fascinating. I would love to see something that feels kind of um, like uh, Italian city states uh, in the Renaissance era, like the, with the Borgias and people like that. That kind of feel would work so perfectly. Um, I would love to see it. But let me know in the chat what you would. Um, particularly like to see uh, a Greek weirwood saying Volantis. Yeah, that would be an interesting one as well. Um, after Matthew Stewart saying the black fires is my all time uh, want for a spin-off bitter steel and blood Raven facing down would be great. Yes, it definitely would. Um, I would agree that um, Varys the early years says a uh, Google uh, bits. Yeah. Nice idea. Um, uh, Alex B. Conquest would be amazing. Um, I would have done that as the first adaptation, but hope we still get it. I'm, I'm beginning to feel we won't. Actually, I should probably say on this one again. I like the idea, but this is building on the fact that they want things that feel different. We've had Game of Thrones, which has got Targaryens with dragons. We've got House of the Dragon, which is Targaryens with dragons. Um, are they going to do another one? Uh, the the invasion will feel quite there are echoes of it in the main story so i'm not sure i'm not sure if we will actually see that one um cursed ballerina saying a shy and stigai pre whatever happened to them yep that would be uh interesting um Reflective Rambling saying uh, we're getting more Middle Earth, more Westeros, but the question is when are we going to get the great polar bear um, uh, uh, Paxu and uh, Valkatuka? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Edge of Heroes, The Fall of a Shy, Cali Summers. There's a couple of people asking for that. Mini series of the heroes of the Age of Heroes. Yeah, I think that would work with my idea of the sort of the legends the stories being told um skandar um hananias saying even when they do duncan egg love to see a blood raven storyline um hopefully following him beyond the wall i don't think they will i think they're just going to keep that to duncan egg um personally i think that's um what we're going to get a biopic of aemon targaryen says so sasuke uh, yep um, Numitor saying I'd love a Valyria series, but might ruin the mystery. Yep. Um, uh, last question for my patrons. Oh, actually, this is my lead linking in with this, uh, saying Robert's Rebellion would make a great limited series. Yes. George Martin was sort of against that at the time. 
a time being a few years ago because he didn't want to do things related in to the characters that were in the main show. Um, I, I wonder now whether if we've got the stage play of uh, Tony at Harren Hall, whether we, there's still scope for it. it. It would be nice. I would like it a lot, but I don't know if um, we will get it. Um, so Alex B saying, what was the consensus pick to play Dunk when it came up earlier? I don't know if we had a consensus. I think it was... Tom Hopper did get a lot of uh, upvotes, although he might be a bit old to play it now. And I think I, I like the idea of a complete new and unknown as well. Um, I think Cole Carlsnock came up with. Um, let's. Uh, so Blue Kiss Garden, so the attack of the Roin and the rise of Grayscale. I hope we would get that in the Nymeria story. Um, uh lady pushin saying robert's traveler's guide made into a series please um well if hbo wish to give me money for it then they're more than welcome um but i i find that unlikely okay um i think um with that i will start to uh to draw this one to a close I've, there's some fantastic um questions and chat and ideas here i hope that's given you a bit of an idea about what is on the radar for um spin-offs for Game of Thrones, the the headlines. I think it's probably worth reiterating if you came in partway through this. We have got nine different things, spin-offs now uh, in the works. The only one which is greenlit is House of the Dragon, which we know about. The rest of them are in development. Some of them have been in development now for three years or so. The Jon Snow um, spin-off has been going for almost as long as the others. It's just it's not it's not been leaked before so this is new to us but this isn't new in terms of it being in development um which means that scripts have been written it means that plots they've they've got an idea they have developed this they they have workshopped it with George R. R. Martin this is not just some Kit Harrington's got some idea and maybe maybe it'll get picked up. This is in the works at HBO. So we, we have to now take this serious, not just a rumour, this is a thing that which is happening. Um, not all nine of these will happen. I suspect that the number that will happen will depend on how successful House of the Dragon is. Um, George R. R. Martin himself is very open and honest with the fact that he's not expecting all of these to make it to screen. Um, I think your guess is as good as mine as to which will. Certainly they will try one of the animes, I'm sure. Certainly we will get at least one other um, of the live actions. Um, the, But none of them, certainly for a couple of years, probably three years. Um, Expect the first announcements. I think this doesn't come from anywhere in particular. This is just what I think, given what we've heard of where they are in the process. Expect announcements on whether something has been quietly dropped or is going to be given a, a pilot or even a full series at some point in the next few months, possibly once House of the Dragon has finished. So that's where we're at. Um, a lot of exciting things. This is HBO's big push to make um a universe uh, a game of thrones universe with lots of things that feel different they don't want just here's another version of game of thrones here's another version of game which is what house of the dragon is going to feel like the house of the dragon will feel a bit game of thronesy it's going to be a bit darker it'll obviously have different people more dragons but it will feel quite game of thronesy the rest of these are not going to feel Game of Thronesy. Some of them will be a lot more light and comedic. Some of them will be a lot more adventurous. Maybe they'll even be like romance. Maybe some. Uh, uh, I don't know. George R. R. Martin is very clear in his mind that his world is big enough for different subgenres within fantasy to be existing. So that's that's that. I'm quite excited about this. There's a lot of good ideas here. Um, I'm still a bit sceptical about the Jon Snow one, I will be honest. I will wait to see what they put to us. But I feel through this live stream, we've worked our way towards something 
that I would I would be able to work with um, as a show. Um, I don't want it just being a bit more of Jon Snow moping around and digging up the past, but Jon Snow trying to adapt to his new life, a character study of somebody who's been through huge amounts, PTSD, trying to start a new life. That could work for me. But with that, um, I think I will say I will see everyone next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about Fire and Blood Part 2, which is um, something that George Martin has been writing. It's the follow-up, obviously, to Fire and Blood Part 1, but he's al- said he's already, already written 200 pages. So this isn't just like a thing which will happen randomly. He is writing it, and it will happen at some point in the next few years, I would have thought. So um, that will be covering a lot of the things we've already talked about here. Uh, Fire and Blood Part 2 will be covering the Blackfire Rebellions. It will be covering all the whole issue with uh, Egg and Blood Raven. It will be covering uh, the period up to Robert's Rebellion, presumably, um, as, as well as the death of the dragons, bringing Dawn into the kingdom, a huge amount of other summer hall. A huge amount of other fascinating moments uh, which will be happening there. Aegon the Fourth, what happens with the uh, swords, Blackfire, Dark Sister. There's a lot to be told. Um, so that's what we're going to look, look at next time. What might we be getting from this story? Uh, if you're watching this back a little bit later, appearing somewhere up here will be a link to other live streams appearing somewhere around here is a link to my Patreon page. Patrons, thank you. I almost forgot to say thank you very much. If you would like to support uh, this channel, then the best way to do that is through Patreon. Okay, thanks everyone. Take care, and I will see you again next time.